70 to 80 years ago, we would have been in a world war. Like, could you imagine telling someone in the trenches, oh, I'm addicted to Instagram? Shut up. You know what I mean? Part of me is like, we go back to extreme ownership and personal responsibility. Log off. Sign but out. I get it. Delete the app. You end up at a random uni. And then the people who happen to be placed near you in halls. Yeah. It's literally Susan on an Excel spreadsheet who randomly decides <laughs> yeah. this. And it's mad to think the amount of Susans or Derricks that have decided people's best friends forever. Next one. Availability bias. I was chatting to uh, one of the guys from work. And there's some digested biscuits in the kitchen. And none of us like digested biscuits. But we're eating digested biscuits every single day because they're just there in the, yeah. in the jar. And yet yeah, whatever available to you you've got to almost instill willpower to avoid it mm. which means that given enough time given enough lack of sleep given enough xyz you're probably going to give in at some point mm-hmm. so yeah design the environment's key the internet goes wild for george mcgill back on modern wisdom it's been a long time man thank you so much for coming right, back it's, on it's good to be back you brought me out of my cave it's good i have indeed yeah. a lot has changed since we were last here yeah, a lot a lot has changed for, for, for uh, both parties, I imagine. Yeah. Always changing. You're down in London now? You were in Manchester last time you saw it? Yeah, you? down in London. A uh, bit more expensive, but <laughs> you get what you pay for. Yeah, you do. A lot of opportunities. Yeah, it's, um, it's certainly very, very different. There's a, a really good Paul Graham essay uh, called Cities and Ambition. Uh-huh. Have you ever heard of it? No. It's one of, one of my favourite ones of his. It's one of the reasons why I moved. And he says that every city sort of whispers something to you, um, whether it's the sort of conversations that you overhear or um, the people that you're around or the cars that drive past or the buildings that you see, you're constantly getting whispered to and you're, you, don't, you don't consciously notice it, but you pick up on it. And because um, I found that it, Paul, Paul, Paul Graham says that in like New York, it's the, the constant whispering is make more money. Um, and that's because every, every, every conversation you over here is like, how much money are you making? Or oh, I made this this month. Uh, whereas in LA, it's be more famous is where it's constantly <laughs> whispering to you. What's London? Um, well, well, he says San Francisco is be um, uh, be more powerful in terms of they don't give a shit if you made like a billion dollars out. Um, if you've inherited a billion dollars, mm. it's more about what you've done. Mm. Uh, with London, um, is it, well, the thing about London is there's almost the little cities within little cities mm. but the minute we've been primarily based in Mayfair have you been to Mayfair before? yeah it's like the it's like the wealthiest part of like right next to Buckingham Palace like Maserati Maserati the, Lamborghini so the, Porsche, what it whispers Rolls to me Roy. is I need to upgrade my fucking Vauxhall Corsa <laughs> that's, that's the most that's the thing I get the most I probably need to get a new car I keep thinking that guy I need to get a new car I've been driving that Vauxhall Corsa since but you don't like drive that much I don't drive that much no I'm, j- I'm joking just rent, just rent a big dick one rent a fucking Maserati when you need it yeah sack it off outside Insta- be an Instagram baller that's the way to go so the internet is ready and waiting moist for some more mental models mental models 101 is the highest performing episode ever on modern wisdom massive shout out to podcast notes for supporting that episode i mean who spoke about it james clear replied to some of our tweets to do with it naval ravikant got tagged in a load so we got a little bit of pressure to make this one not yeah. shit but we're going to be fine i've got an absolute belter to start you off cool, with let's go and this is from uh, Gabriel Weinberg's big book of mental models. Gabriel, if you're listening, I know that you're busy, man, but I'm ready and waiting whenever you are. Uh, and this is a mental model from tennis. The, okay. The unforced error. Oh, okay. So the concept is that you need to focus on being less wrong, not because of an external situation, but because of your own poor judgment or execution. So you've got to think about how making a bad first impression, that's your fault. Like if you didn't get ready, insufficient preparation, that's an unforced error. Touches a little bit on um, some of the asymmetries we were talking about before. You're in a car crash because you were texting, unforced error. Mm. Like you've caused that situation. It wasn't, there wasn't some tornado that came out of somewhere and picked your car up and threw it to one side. This was an error that you caused. So you were talking previously about not aiming to be right all the time, just simply avoiding being wrong. Mm. And an unforced error is the most basic way that you can be wrong. Like, independent of all of the circumstances, you done fucked up. And isn't the argument that, I forgot, I don't know the complete tennis metaphor, but the amateurs 
make way more enforced errors than professionals or it's something along those lines. I guess so. Yeah. It's an interesting one. That kind of ties into probably the hardest concept to wrap your head around. You, you ever heard of that Jocko Willings, like extreme ownership, where you just take ownership of every single thing that goes on in your life and it's always, you know, the famous good rant where he's, He's one of those, um, one of the best videos on YouTube. If you're having like a shit day, I recommend it because it's just this, the hardest Navy SEAL. He's like the hard, he's like the hard Navy SEAL amongst hard Navy SEALs. You know what I mean? Where yeah, yeah. his mates go, fucking hell, he's intense. Yeah. Um, so he's that guy. Uh, the, what's the Bradley Cooper film? The American Sniper. Yeah. So Jocko, I think was that guy's mm. um, like commander essentially or oh, wow. the, the boss. And he's talking about when he was in Iraq and people would come over to him um, and say, hey, boss, we've not got enough machinery or we've not got X, Y, Z or things gone wrong. And he would just always reply with good. Like no matter what, but he goes opportunity to work on this or opportunity to do that. And it's always something that he can control. Um, and he's obsessed with this concept of extreme ownership. And he tells, I think it's in his TED talk and in his book where he talks about, because it's very, it's very all well to like chat in like a, a nice little podcast about, oh, I've been doing X, Y, Z on my gym routine or my yeah, meditation. Yeah, yeah. But when you're at war, <laughs> I have so much more respect for somebody when they, they're, if they're chatting about uh, interesting concepts and they go, oh, I applied this at war. I go, oh, okay, I might listen now. Because I go, Matt versus hell. terrain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's literally the fucking terrain, right? It's <laughs> <laughs> literally. Well, Jocko's knee deep in yeah, terrain, yeah, 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 face yeah, yeah. down in terrain. Yeah, so he, he's up to, up to his knees in terrain, yeah. So um, he talks about how in Iraq, where you got uh, where he says that he had some friendly fire go wrong. And it was his, in his troops that it happened. And I think it was an Iraqi soldier lost their life because um, it was the, his sort of friendly Iraqi troops firing back at his own mm, American troops mm, mm. and somebody died. And as a high up Navy SEAL, that's one of the worst mistakes you can ever make. Mm. And the reason he ended up keeping his job is because he took 100% blame over everything and he was so impressive how he managed to just take extreme ownership over it. And it wasn't even, you could argue it wasn't even his fault. Like he he wasn't directly there, but he said, I, I there's certain things we could have done. There's certain things I could have prepared for. And you think about how much I do it all the time, like little stuff where I'll be running late and I'll blame it on someone. Else. You know what I mean? You blame it on something else. And you got like, the concept of extreme ownership of everything that can go wrong is ultimately my fault and even when it's not it sometimes still helps to think that do you get what I mean because mm-hmm. there's so many stuff like where if you act let's say you have two I always go back to the thought experiment of two identical versions of yourselves the one that takes extreme ownership over everything would just always outperform the one who didn't right well what's Jordan Peterson's main shtick been for the last couple of years rights versus responsibilities mm. and he says you have two choices Either nothing matters or everything matters. And if you choose to say that everything matters, then you don't get to use the excuse that it was someone else's fault. It is always something that is within your control. And this touches on another point, Jocko Willink, mental model that you haven't done yet, anti-fragile. Yeah, that's um, that comes from Nassim Taleb. Nassim Taleb. Um, who wrote The Black Swan, Fooled by Randomness, and a few other interesting concepts. And the idea of anti-fragility is, let's say, for example, you have quite a, let's say you looked at this, like, glass here. Mm -hmm. This is by very nature, as we just found out in the kitchen earlier, when you fucking (laughs) smashed the glass everywhere and I smacked (laughs) my head on something in the kitchen, uh, behind the scenes that will never get released. Um, if you drop this on a concrete floor or a, a kitchen floor, as we saw then, it's fragile by its very, very nature in that when disorder happens, the whole thing basically disintegrates. Mm-hmm. So that's something that's fragile. When disorder occurs, mm-hmm. it breaks down. The contrast to that is what's well known as ro- robust, which is when you drop it on the floor, like a plastic cup, it mm-hmm. sort of stays the same. It doesn't get worse, mm-hmm. but it also doesn't get better. Mm-hmm. So what Talib sort of identified is there's nothing that's truly the opposite of fragility because robust isn't the opposite of fragility because it stays the same. Neutral. Minus one to zero. Exactly. Whereas the plus one would be something that's anti-fragile, that it gets stronger from disorder. So the most obvious example is your immune system, that you give it a little bit of tuberculosis and all of a sudden, oh, it knows, it gets used to dealing with that and now it's much better at dealing with that. Whereas if you 
if you prevent a child from sort of playing around in the mud and damaging a little bit of its immune system each time, you never grow. If you never exercise and put your body under stress, you never grow. So you, your body's almost an anti-fragile machine um, in the the more disorder you give it, the more it adapts. Of course, it has a breaking point where you got, you can overstep the mark and you, you break your legs or whatever you do. Yeah. But, or you catch tuberculosis. Yeah, so yeah, you catch tuberculosis. But the concept of anti-fragility is, a, is an interesting one because you, you see it all the time where you see two people go through very, very similar events and some people say that's the best thing that ever happened to them and they mm. compound as a result and they use that. Mm. And then other people who did the exact same thing, it's the, the worst thing that ever happened to them. And yeah, I think becoming more anti-fragile is it's difficult, but it's um, something... I need to get better at it's something that's very very difficult today I think so so some of the ideas that comes to mind I saw a tweet earlier on hilarious tweet um, someone's five year old child had said to his mother the reason he wasn't cleaning my room was because it was good for his immune response and you're like you clever little bastard hey, didn't you, there, yeah. you fucking clever little wow. bastard they were like, like Joshua why haven't you cleaned your room oh it's good for my immune immune system <laughs> Fuck you, Joshua. You smart, woke, <laughs> little five-year-old bastard. So uh, one like really good practical example I heard came from Josh Wolf, who he's the uh, the founder of Lux Capital. Um, very, very, very clever guy. Um, he has quite a few mental models, which you can go on to. But he talked about when he was deciding to invest in a certain company, um, which was nuclear cleanup. So cl- cleaning up mm-hmm. uh, nuclear waste. waste, essentially. And he realized that it was an anti-fragile decision in the sense that no matter what um, chaos occurred, mm-hmm. it was upside for him. Because let's say, for example, the world carried on investing heavily in nuclear waste. Well, at one point, there's going to be an accident, which means that there's going to be need for nuclear cleanup. Mm-hmm. Or if the world decides, you know what, we need less nuclear activity, therefore they need a nuclear... Clear up company clever, essentially. Clever so, man. and as a result, obviously Fukushima happened, and he made a lot, a lot of money. Was because, he prepped ready for? Yeah, that? he was the only company that could that could deal with that. And not only did he make a lot of money, but he saved so much damage Ecology, to the world as well. Yeah, so, lives. Um, so that's like that, that's a good example of where you apply it to to business in particular as well. A couple of good examples here where anti fragility has been applied in an athletic sense, uh, and you can take this and adopt it for yourself in a, a very personal sense. Katrin David's daughter, CrossFit athlete, one of the fittest women on the planet, was the fittest woman on the planet uh, a couple of times. I remember seeing an interview with her uh, as a part of Ben Bergeron's Chasing Excellence, fantastic book, highly recommended if you've not read it. Very easy, very narrative-based, quick read. And uh, she says, sometimes when people haven't had enough sleep or they haven't prepped right for a day's training, they go into the gym and they've got a defeatist mentality mm. and they say, well, I'm not feeling very good. I'm tired. I'm this, I'm that, I'm the other. Whereas she goes in and her mentality is, this is an opportunity for me to train at suboptimal preparation mm. uh, uh, scenario. So this is it, the CrossFit Games last year. They didn't know, but they just got pulled out and put on the Wednesday. They didn't know there was going to be a Wednesday event out of nowhere. Then on the flight back, the plane was delayed. Everybody was late. Everyone was going to get less sleep for the next day. And that was the one day that they were supposed to recover and blah, blah, blah. All of that, she is preparing herself for that. She leans into, she calls it leaning into discomfort as if you've invited it through the door. So she doesn't shy away from it. The same as if you put your hand on somebody's chest and you press against them, they press back. You press a bit harder and they press back a little Mm. bit more. And that's the kind of mindset that she's cultivated. You might want to talk about... Uh, the who was the guy from Josh Waitskin? Josh Waitskin and his reframing of his child's reign. Oh yeah, that's one of my favourite ones. Of um, I always think about when I do have a kid to touch wood someday, um, not some someday soon touch touch wood again. Um, <laughs> that'll bite me in the ass. Yeah. It's not um, the the sort of lessons you want to apply, and I think obviously everybody's almost playing this weird quite meta Darwinian game. Obviously they're literally passing on their parents' DNA um, by by the nature of it. And everybody's passing on their parents' DNA and then they're passing on their parents' DNA. But you're also kind of passing on, okay, what was the stuff that my parents did right? What did I like about it? Obviously you need to do a 
little iOS update for the current generation because obviously like these things weren't around back then so now you've got to think of smartphone policies right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but you try and take what your parents did right and then what your parents could have or should have done as well and imagine, imagine of ideas as well yeah and the better childhood you have the the more the less stuff that you have to change you just you just copy and paste over um, and and then you obviously look at ideas that you hear from other parents or other parenting stuff and I've not really gone deep down the parenting rabbit hole yet no. uh, again for uh, hopefully for a while but he talks about how when he uh, his son was very, very young, um, first few years of his life, the first thing that parents will do to change the locus of control of a child, and it's not a conscious thing, it's very, very subconscious. And it's, the mo- it's one of the most consistent conversations you ever hear. Uh, certainly, I don't know about other countries, but particularly in the UK, of the conversation about the weather where it's, oh, weather's nice today, isn't it? And it goes, yeah, it's great when it's like this, which rarely happens over here. It's like, weather's miserable today. And it's like, yeah, the weather's miserable, isn't it? Um, and he noticed that parents would constantly have this conversation with their kids, whereas if the weather was bad outside, therefore, oh, we should feel a bit rubbish and we should just stay in and play board games. And he realised that that is one of the first moments that a kid gets conditioned to have this low locus of control. And what he did instead was flip it on its head, which is whenever it's pissing it down outside, oh, look at how beautiful it is. And you could argue it is beautiful, right? There's rain coming down, there's storms and there's thunder. So the perspective is it definitely is beautiful. And let's go out and play in the rain. And then you condition the mind that, oh, whilst everybody else gets really upset about this moment, this is actually a moment to truly experience and appreciate and I try and like now when it's raining, I catch my, that, that's one of the metaphors that's stuck in my head for the longest. Because even when it's raining now, I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake, yeah. get my clothes out. And I go, first off, it's not that bad. It's water. Like, really, it's not that bad. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and if you just say good, and I now look like a psychopath because there's people in the rain who are like, from cover like that, and I'm fucking buzzing, smiling, because I've got that metaphor in my head. Yeah. yeah. And it just goes back to the Jocko Willing good thing as well. Like when everything's going, so this is a weird one that I've tried to, practice a little bit of late is when everything's going bad I say good and when everything's going good I try to say bad because I know that some psycho- psychologically I sometimes take my, my I might take my foot off the gas so are you, are you stood in the rain like the guy at the end of Shawshank Redemption crawling out of the pipe of shit looking up and being like <laughs> yeah, yeah basically yeah. Was that whole, like, um, yeah, I'm just trying to think of some bad, like, bad news like oh your girlfriend's just broken out of you good opportunity to <laughs> she was a bitch spend anyway. more yeah spend, spend more time by yourself um but then when someone <laughs> oh just just made a hundred million pounds oh bad you might lose your ambition you know what i mean you've got to constantly have um, that to to fact check yourself. yeah it's some weird zen paradox going on with constantly playing another gr- great example actually from a podcast earlier this year with alex hutchinson who wrote the book endure so this is the definition of anti-fragile as far as i'm concerned he's got Elite performing athletes of varying degrees on the top end sat on a bike doing a VO2 max test. They got a face mask on, which is controlling the air in and out of their lungs. And these guys are doing maths questions on an iPad while they're doing it. So they're at a fairly high heart rate. They're completing these maths questions on the iPad on the bike. So they don't actually need to think much. It's not a cognitively demanding task to exercise. Legs are just turning. But it is a cognitively demanding task they've got on the screen in front of them. Then they start to push the heart rate a little bit higher, a little bit higher, and get them really quite far up into the high percentages of their max. Then they restrict the air through the mask so that it's like breathing through a straw or breathing mm. at altitude. And the absolute best performers, obviously a lot of people, their cognition drops, they're distracted, they feel uncomfortable. The absolute best performers get better at their maths problems when they restrict the air through the mouth because that's when they start to lean in to that discomfort uh, as if they've invited it through the door. Mm. And I just, I love, love that, that whole concept. He told me that story the first time I'm sat and my, the hairs are standing up on, on my arms. Cause I'm like, fuck, that's so cool. These guys are in there at the peak of discomfort. And then someone turns the discomfort up more and they go, good. That's mm. why I'm here. Mm. That's what I'm here to do. Mm. And you just think that is the difference. Another perfect example we talked about passion in life. Steffi Graf, one of the greatest tennis players of all time, gets tested at 12 years old as part of, I think she's German, part of the German youth tennis program. 
They test her and they're testing all of the athletes on two broad domains. First one is skill, mechanical skill. Second one is passion and inspiration to train. And she scores 10 out of 10 on both of them. So it's like, good fucking luck trying to beat her. Like, not only is she more talented than you, but she will outwork you and it won't even feel like work to her. Mm. Well, she creates an individual like that. It's the I mean, it's, like, it's, a, it's a perfect story. It's so right? many there. There's so many stuff in the algorithm. I definitely find the biggest influence in my output, general awareness and um, what's the correct word? Well, yeah, I, I just say output and the way I think is who I'm around. And I know that sounds fucking cliche. You sound like you're at some Tony Robbins seminar. <laughs> you just have to get new friends, man. But um, when you, I, I just find. I always use this thought experiment of pick the purse, pick, imagine you again, identical, but we tweak two variables in these two parallel universes. One where you spend the most amount of time or the person you spend the most amount of time with is the person you know, whether you know them in your actual real life or you know them via, you follow them on Instagram, you see them on YouTube, who is the most positive or has the best output work ethic the way they think that you truly admire you're around that individual the most let's say you have a, like a guy like David Goggins and he's just constantly like going making you jump in ice yeah yeah just going, get in the fucking ice <laughs> get man in the ice. Um, you've got that guy it, versus David. the everyone has one in their friendship circle just the sloth mm. you know what I mean he's constantly going oh he's not actually that good he's only because he's this or uh, yeah yeah they're rubbish you know that sort of individual who's constant you, when you go- fixed mindset when you leave Classic them you feel, you feel like you've got an illness and you go fucking hell <laughs> I'm slower I'm fatigued I, yeah. I life is worse as a result of that individual and the, imagine you spend again the exact same in your DNA your genetics your your situation one where you spend it with the, the best person, one where you spend it with the worst person. And after a year, those two people, as in your two opposing selves mm-hmm. in these two universes, suddenly some Rick and Morty shit happens and you mm-hmm. fucking meet one another. Those are two different people. Very much so. Like, but it's, it's difficult, man. Like you are so much less in control of the people that you're around than you are of yourself. And I think that... What do you mean? Well... I can't tell you, let's say that I spend every day with you for the next year. I can't tell you how to be. I can choose who I choose to be oh, yeah. with, but I have a limited number of people that I can choose to be with. I don't know everybody. I don't know who is necessarily good for me. It takes me time to work out who's toxic and who's not. Yeah. I also think that it's hard making friends when you're older. That's like, true. That's making true. Fr- no one ever talks about this because it sounds like some sort of like weird autistic social leper bullshit, but... It's true. It's really hard. It is. Like, no one ever wants to say, I wish I had some new friends. I'm 25, 30, 35, Mm. 40 years old. Be really cool if I had some new friends or some different friends. And you think, well, hang on a second. People say all the time that they would love a partner. They can be single and love to have a partner that was like X and Y and Z. But we just assume that the social circle that we're in will have people come and go like the fucking tide and we'll pick up some random ones. But what were we talking about in the last one? The most valuable asset of the 21st century, as far as you were concerned, high agency. High agency people will seek out those friends. You know who I think's mega, mega high agency person? David Perel. David Perel told me on a podcast, he actively seeks out spending time with influencers off Instagram, spending time with comedians, spending time with intellectuals. He's always the dumbest person in the room in one of multiple domains, and he keeps changing the domain. Mm. You're like, can you imagine what David fucking Perel's phone book's like? Neil deGrasse Tyson. Like, you know, it just... You know, with the the weirdest one when it comes to the social stuff is that it it happens really early on at these weird look at the dies. Like the classic example is in university or college when... People, you end up at a random uni. Sometimes you even choose that one. You just end up there. And then the people who happen to be placed near you in halls. And it's literally it's literally Susan on an Excel spreadsheet who randomly decides this. <laughs> yeah. But it's mad to think the amount of Susans or Derricks yeah. that have decided people's best friends forever. Mm. And they automatically assume 
that, oh, we should have been best friends. But I always use this example. So one cool mental model to follow, because this then goes down a, a relationship tangent. But if you look at, and this comes from Josh Wolf earlier with the, uh, the anti-fragility stuff, is he has this great mental model of the directional arrows of progress, where if you look at the, the computer in the 1950s, it was the size of probably the house that we're in now mm -hmm. in a university where there was maybe only a limited amount of them in the world and very, very few people could use them. Mm. And then as decades go on and you get to nearer the, the 70s, you have the, the home computer and all of a sudden it's got smaller in size, and it, but it's cheaper and it's more powerful. Mm. And then you get the laptop, which we have here in the, the a few decades gone by. Then the next few decades you get the smartphone, it's even more smaller, it's even more compact and now it sits in your pocket. Mm. And now you look at it, now you've got the airpods that now sit in your ears so you see these directional arrows of progress and i know the toby lucky the shopify uh, ceo has a similar thing where he's trying to analyze future trends of following this directional arrow of progress so you you can't predict the future but you can assume computing as we know it or or hardware as we know it will continue to get smaller more powerful cheaper and nearer to our bodies and obviously everybody talks about the contact lens that's mm -hmm. coming or whatever it's going to be and i always apply this with um, relationships in that if you look to our maybe great 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 grandparents generation where you would you might marry um, well if you let's say we go back to hunter and gatherer times you might just marry whoever you got assigned to in the tribe or whoever mm. you had to fight Dave and see what happened or fight Jess and see what happened and then obviously you go to our grandparents time where you would literally if you wasn't married by 18 or 21 or whatever that little age window was mm -hmm. you was an outcast yeah. and you would meet someone from your school or your next door neighbor that was it you had someone from your school or your next door neighbor who's it going to be mm -hmm. so you had 15 people to choose from yeah and then obviously um, you have women coming into the workplace and you have the feminism movement and people would sort of delay marriage a little bit and you had a wider choice you'd maybe meet people at work or you might meet them at a bar mm -hmm. and then you have OK Cupid that comes along um, so now you can meet people online but it tends to be a bit of an older demographic then you have Tinder that comes along and there's more and more choice and yeah. you can cut you can meet I, I know people now I know more and more couples who are from different countries I go how often would that have happened yeah. 50 years ago like that is such a recent thing of the amount of um, kids that are going to be born who are going to be dual nationality. So you're looking at the directional arrows of progress there of more choice, um, more people you're dating, you get to get more and more resources. And there's a, a novel called After On, great podcast as well. Oh, well read. Yeah, have you, you, have you listened to After On yet, the book? Yep. Oh, no, oh, no, sorry, not the book, but the podcast. Really good. Fantastic. So he has a scene, uh, a bit he writes in that where the AI gets so good that it matches, it's like, a imagine Tinder, but it's an AI that sorts it for you and picks a perfect person based off your interest, their personality, the way you like someone to look and the way that person likes to, someone to look. Because you've got to realise there's probably a thousand people out there who would be the best relationship you could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And you've got to think 99.999% of relationships, this sounds really an awful thing to say, but aren't, probably the best relationship for that individual if you looked at it from a maybe a completely objective so many simulations running at once we settle on the nearest best thing yeah basically but i mean it's getting better but you're looking at that direction of it's not at least it's not your school or your next door neighbor yeah. you know what i mean at More least it's choice. getting better yeah. but you can imagine a scenario in the future where everybody meets that truly perfect individual or if that exists that would be that would be interesting but that's what rob reed's hypothesis is anyway i like it Next one, availability bias. Oh yeah, this is one, <laughs> there's a, uh, a hilarious example I have about this one, which is I went back when it was at Social Chain. Mm -hmm. um, they have a, a a Harry Potter fan page. It's like the biggest Harry Potter community in the world. I'm not a Harry Potter fan at all, but I was trying to do this morning meditation habit, and I went <laughs> upstairs in one of the rooms just trying to meditate there. <laughs> I remember and, when he used to do this. And wasn't the, the, the is this the bit about the jigsaw? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So there's, a, so there's a Harry Potter jigsaw in the middle of the room. And I've, I've seen, I think I saw the first two Harry Potters and I dipped early. You know how for our generation, it was such a big thing. Mm -hmm. I couldn't give a shit about Harry Potter. Yeah. Um, i got a good friend, Hannah, who loves Harry Potter. So she's going to hate me for that. But um, couldn't give a shit about Harry Potter. And I was sat there meditating. Um, and I just observed my Surrounded own, observing my own thoughts and I, 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 I just observed my own thoughts and I remember I'd just catch myself maybe five minutes in and I'd go 
I wonder how Hermione and Ron felt about Harry being the face. I go, what, what do you think about it? <laughs> come, back to, come back to your breathing, come back to your breathing. And then I go, oh, I wonder what it was like being Daniel Radcliffe and that famous. <laughs> it must have been crazy being that famous. And I go, come back to your breathing, come back to your breathing. <laughs> and then I, I'm like, I wonder how J.K. Rowling managed to get that out. And I remember a closed meditation session going, I thought more about Harry Potter in the last 20 minutes than I had in my entire life just because there's a fucking Harry Potter joke. So, so like, at the minute, I'm um, chatting to uh, one of the guys from work and there's some digestive biscuits in the kitchen and none of us like digestive biscuits, but we're eating digestive biscuits every single day because they just are there in the, yeah. in the jar, the seafood jar. Um, and yet whatever's available to you, um, you've got to almost instill willpower to avoid it, mm. which means that given enough time, given enough lack of sleep, given enough X, Y, Z, you're probably going to give in at some point. Mm -hmm. So yeah, design the environment's key. There's a a really good example again, Gabriel Weinberg. uh, Sarah Lichtenstein did a study where people were asked about 41 leading causes of death and they massively overestimated the risk of sensationalised types. So tornadoes, floods, botulism or smallpox vaccines were 50 times overestimated and stroke and diabetes were a hundred times underestimated. Interesting. Because the availability bias of the news and that links into filter bubble, of course, which is like a, a, a echo chamber that occurs due to this availability bias. That's reinforced by the algorithms that we see online because what you agree with, you will tend to click on more which then reinforces feeding you more of this stuff because the system thinks, oh, he's clicking on that, therefore he wants to see more of that. But as Jordan Peterson says, be friends with people that want the best for you doesn't mean with be friends that with people who tell you what you want to hear. Very different. The kid always wants sweets doesn't mean the kid that sweets is always good for the kid. Mm. So the system constantly feeding you things that you agree with isn't necessarily the best for you. But the issue with that, and I have this, is that how do you then go about fixing this problem of social media? Um, there's, there's obviously somebody who knows the space quite well um, it, that people will insist on, okay, well, well, Facebook needs to change its algorithms where it gives people content they don't want to see, but then they won't spend time on the platform. Mm. So it's, it, I'm, I'm looking at, if you look at Mark Zuckerberg, you kind of get your decisions a little bit. Oh. And I, I look at it and go, because you've seen the, the recent news about the, um, the American Senate where they want to basically have it installed in the app that once somebody scrolled so much they get cut off and you go whoa 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 whoa, whoa. this is some weird George Orwell shit and you know it's Nancy from Florida who who's heard about Instagram in an article and, and she's trying to enforce so it. if we're so emailing on WhatsApp <laughs> yeah that, that, that exact sort of shit but I, I think about this a bit and I, I thought there's, there's two ways to potentially fix this problem um, first one is that instead of trying to fix a, a heroin problem look at the needles so instead of trying to stop the heroin going around, the social media addiction, let's look at the needles, which is the smartphones. The, the app, um, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, etc. are never going to fix the problem because that, we'll come on to this in a second, but that's their incentives. That's their business model. They're never going to stop doing it. McDonald's aren't going to start selling kale. Mm. I'm, I'm sure they have, but it was horrific, I imagine, right? <laughs> and they only did it for a PR bit. But they're never going to be their full product of kale. It's going to be greasy fries and a greasy burger because that's what people go there for and that's what they're incentivized to do and that's what their business model is. So instead, the people who have the power are Apple and Google, who own Android, obviously. So what you need to do, they've recently released the screen time stuff, but why isn't it that people can't, let's say you flip, I call it the ultimate judo move, where you flip social media or the mental models that social media have about the way they've conditioned people on its head. And with the screen time stuff, you create a social network where I can see out of my friends who spent the most amount or the least amount of time on Instagram and it's ranked with them at the top of the leaderboard. Mm. And that would be quite a cool feature. And then the final one that they should do is if it's decided, if it's decided, oh, what I think they should do um, is if it's decided that these things are bad for people's mental health. Okay, well, let's tax them uh 5% or 10%, whatever that tax is agreed to be, which would be billions of dollars. And instead of focusing it on government bodies that don't have a clue what they're going to do, just do an X prize where, okay, whichever top 20 entrepreneurs come up with a solution that's falsifiable by science in terms of helping people's mental health, they get the funding. They Mm. get the funding. And you filter the money away from these 
uh, things that are arguably damaging people's mental health into these companies. And and then you, Facebook can carry on being Facebook, Instagram can carry on being Instagram, Snapchat can carry on being Snapchat, but people have the control in terms of they can customise their own screen time way more, play games that way, and the money's getting filtered into these mental health startups. I like the analogy about the needle and the and the drug because it is, it's the delivery mechanism, isn't it, through the phone. I would love to see the relative time on site desktop versus mobile now because I think previously, at the last time I checked, it was like 85% mobile. I bet that's even gone up. Mm-hmm. I bet that's gone up more. I bet it's like 90 95%. And that's not to say that the desktop version of the apps isn't that good. It's just that the mobile version is so overwhelmingly addictive yeah. and convenient that people can't get so around this is it. it. This is my thing about the sort of anti-social social network is what um, it needs. A, it needs, a, again, a PR stuff as most of my stuff do. It needs a name and stuff. Cool. But basically uh, what so a lot of the social networks do is almost have these, takes our relationships and puts them in this weird little digital stuff, and this little hierarchy going on. Whereas... Being on Instagram for five hours a day, if you heard someone, if you watch me doing that, it's quite a sad thing. And if that was in the leaderboard, you go, oh, and Dave knew that everyone else was looking at him. You spent five hours on Instagram today. Yeah. You actually look like a bit of a loser. Yeah, you look like you don't have a life. So. And you can, fl- you can actually use the biases that these social media outlets have used on the whole of humanity. Turn it upside down. And just full on judo move. Yeah, use the momentum against them. Yeah. There's a, an interesting app. I can't remember the name of it. I'll find it and put it in the show notes where you pick a time that you're not going to be on your phone for and it plants a tree. And the longer time that you pick Uh, that you're not going to be on for, the bigger the tree grows and you add friends, kind of like a game, social networking game. And then if you pick your phone up during the time that you promised you weren't going to be on it, your tree dies. Mm. You've got a dead tree. And it's a game between you and your friends to see who can get the biggest orchard. Oh, uh, okay. And it's all animated and the trees look cool and at Christmas it changes to Christmas trees. So that's kind of similar yeah. to, what, to what you're talking about there. But you're right. I, I don't know. There needs to be some real innovation when it comes to the problem of social media at the moment because it's getting to that stage now where I think it's a little bit more than just people looking at it and going, oh, that's an interesting problem. People spend too much time on their phones. You've got children growing up now who've got iPads at two years old, what does that actually do? Like when you've got someone who is conditioned to a screen this far from their face with the dopamine drops that you get and most people aren't potentially going to be armed with 74 minute long blog posts like some of the stuff that gets posted in the Modern Wisdom in a Circle that's how to reduce notifications, turn your screen grayscale, like all this sort of stuff. That's a lot of time from a young age to be conditioned to something that we've never, ever, ever had before. You were discussing earlier on what would happen if someone did MDMA twice a week for an entire year. What would that do to the synapses in their brain? Well, what does it do to someone's brain who's using this sort of technology from a young mm. age? I know you're a tech optimist, so you're skeptical yeah, of this sort of Yeah, stuff. and I, I do like... Because I always think it's so easy with a lot of this stuff to focus on the negatives because they're so overwhelming. But... Let's look at how many people have become millionaires or been able to run their own business because of these these platforms. Let's look at how many people, like I think 70%, this is completely a stat I've overheard someone else mm-hmm. say, mm-hmm. but it's, it's, I imagine it's around about that, of something like 70% of relationships are now started on the internet. Now started on the, internet. Yeah. Um, the amount of WhatsApp group chats, I, I think it's a crazy stat, which is the age of people coming out of the closet um, homosexual people, whether gay or lesbian or, or whatever they want to identify as, has significantly gone down because they can find similar examples like them and join a Reddit community grinder, about what they're into. Man. It's all grinder. It's what I mean. It's grinder. But what? I, but so I, I'm just going. Uh, so, no, so, but hold on. We, we were chatting earlier about grinder. Gr- grinder. Yeah, because that's that's <laughs> where me and Chris obviously met. Um, <laughs> And uh, which I was saying earlier, the setup here does look like an adult adult film set. But um, <laughs> Chris is casting couch. But basically, what we're saying earlier is seventy to eighty years ago. Um, have I got that right? Yeah, roughly. A little bit more. Roughly. Um, Conscription. Yeah, we we would have been in a world war in the trenches, and realistically, we probably would have died, um, or would have seen stuff that. If I would have seen a film of right now, I'd probably be still having nightmares of it 12 months later. Mm-hmm. So part, 
I can't, like, could you imagine telling someone in the trenches, oh, I'm addicted to Instagram? Shut up. You know what I mean? I, so I get so it. I, I, I have, I, part of me is like, we go back to extreme ownership and personal responsibility. Log off. Sign so, out. I get it. Delete the app. I get it if you're underage and that sort of stuff. Yes, that's a different question. Mm-hmm. But we seem as a, 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 our condition as humanity. So this is one of my mental models that I thought about a lot, which is, I call it Zeitzelmers. So it's a crossover of the current zeitgeist and Alzheimer's. So we kind of forget, we kind of, every generation assumes that their problems are the worst there is and forgets about the fact that we are just a a blink in humanity's history, but we're also connected to all these previous generations and we don't really realise it. And our generation is chatting about social media addiction, whereas I think it was my great-granddad where who... um, was a doctor, my dad was saying, and he was, I think it was World War One. I. I forgot which battle line it was at, and so many people were dying on the battlefield, he ran out and was just rescuing bodies for hours and hours and end. And I'm fucking complaining about Instagram stories. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's, I don't, so what I think when you've, when you've got to take a wider frame on this, and of course there's some stuff we can do, and we can look at the X prizes we stuff we mentioned earlier, but come on. Because if, if we fix the Instagram problem, people start moaning about something else. I know I'm sounding like a 50s dad right now. And I'm I, I get bit, it, man. But... So, I mean, first off, I think you need to be careful because everything that you say will be <clears> used <throat> on the internet. And if you don't continue to brand well, Zeit Selmers, which yeah. to me, to me sounds like <laughs> sparkling water, is going to be quoted by people on the internet. If a guy works at a market and I'm not doing a horrific when it comes yeah. to my brand. Anybody who wants terms. to rebrand some of George's mental models, please, for the love of God, get, <laughs> get in touch because they're terrible. But yeah, I get what you mean. I had a brief discussion with Theo and Eve from Social Chain the same day that we had our Mental Models 101 chat. In that discussion, I said exactly the same thing as you. However... As society progresses, the fidelity and resolution with which we look at our well-being has to advance as well. It's no good saying a hundred years ago you'd have been in the trenches because it is not a hundred years ago. The advancement of well-being of humanity as a whole requires us to continue to look at this with a finer and finer viewpoint. We need to continue. Okay, just because it's not as bad as it was doesn't mean it's as good as it can be. I get that, yeah. And it's a, I, I, I get what you mean. I do, I appreciate... There's somewhere between, I think, what we both of us are saying. There's some happy medium there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, of, of a, like a, a slightly tangent note, that as society continues progressing, because um, we, we face an issue now of too much of abundance. That's what all our problems are. We've got too much information. We've got too much food that's making us fat. You know what I mean? We've got too many things going on. Life's too good that as a result, we're kind of like a heroin addict who's got everything, constantly getting everything, and as a result, ends up feeling nothing. And I think that we'll see richer and richer, As sorry, as society gets richer and richer, people start paying weirdly for negative experiences. You see it now with like the likes of Mother and how big people, like half marathons, and I'm seeing marathons more and more, or meditation retreats, and um, ultimately I think would it come down to a scenario where and I was wondering would I pay for this or where <laughs> imagine a crazy VR scenario where I could go and be for five minutes see what it was really like well, in isolation the trenches time. isolation yeah. time no but let's say I could see what it was like in the trenches and I could see that and I go oh and I take that off and there's a result going back to contrast and the last one I go fucking hell it's so good like life is so good I, I could have it. been fighting a war and it, we don't we forget how, again, I don't want to sound like Tony Robbins here, mm-hmm. but we forget, and I don't have any beef with Tony, but um, we forget how bad it's been throughout so much of human history. Uh, because the issue is everyone else who's around you is born now. So you know, you don't get to see Dave from the trenches. We go, how, how was your day, mate? And he goes, I've just been here. Echo chamber, availability bias, contrast. But that's why I'd say the most important thing on the sort of VR front to watch <laughs> My favourite clip of all time. Everybody who I sent it to, guys, it's changed me. It's the best, like, th- three minutes or Roy. two minutes. Yeah, Roy, if Roy from Rick and Morty. Um, In the show notes below, yeah, go watch it. It's just, fantastic. Just don't go back to the carpet store, is all I'll say. Do not go back to the carpet store. Ever. I actually... So, one of the things... I don't know... You, you might know this... Uh, it's not in my new place. It was when I was in Manchester. Is it the above photo my, on the wall of yeah, Roy? Yeah, above where I got changed is Roy falling off in the final scene where he falls off, breaks his back and dies and it's the Roy score all over. Yeah. And I, I catch myself playing that, like Tim Urban talks about this from Wait But Why and you go, realistically, 
this is just a video game. Like what we're playing is just a video game. We, you, what are you like? And this sounds really weird, but you just wait. You're just born one day, and you're this fucking shaven chimp, and you you take over. I've got an iPhone, and I do da da da. And then the end, it just it you die, and it's depending on I guess your, your religion and stuff. But I'd say you just die, and it's likely yeah, all right. over, or you or you certainly won't remember much in the next life. So it's just a video game. Um, and I think watching that Roy clip quite regularly, everyone who watches it goes. Oh fuck! That's what life basically. Is. We're just playing a game of Roy. Mm. So Roy, for the people that are listening, Roy is a scene from Rick and Morty. Uh, Morty goes into a virtual reality game where he's born, becomes an NFL player, lives the life of this guy called Roy. Then he dies at the end, comes back out, but he's lived this whole life, right? Comes back out, and Rick then does a like analysis of how he played, yeah, yeah. how he played the game, and it. You're totally right. It is that the ability to view things with that broad perspective and to mm. take yourself out of the situation is a big part of it. So what I want to move on to is, I can't remember what we did last time, but let's quickly go through Hanlon's razor, Occam's razor, and then let's do McGill's razor. Still Yet again, good. internet. If we can find something to rebrand it with, then um, please feel free. So I guess uh, Occam's razor is probably the most like well-known one from philosophy of if in doubt, you go with the, if you're presented with two similar arguments um, and you can't make your mind up on which one, you go with the most simplest solution or you, the reason why it's called a razor is because you lean towards it. People often, I think, and again, I might not know this well enough, but people often think, no, therefore the simplest solution is always the answer. No, no, no. You assume the simplest solution is the answer, but then you work from there and you look for counter evidence, etc. But you assume that. Whereas Hanlon's razors, another version of that where if you're, let's say somebody's pissed you off um, and you have equal evidence, was it out of malice or was it out of them not just thinking? Do not attribute to uh, malice what can be afforded to stupidity. Exactly. So uh, Hanlon's razor is just assume that it was down to their stupidity or it was down to their negligence. Thinking it wasn't because they're a bad person. And then the razor I have... um, is if presented with two situations, choose the one and that will bring about the most amount of luck. And I'd say this is, if I had to give, I always say every episode, if I had to pick one minute on one, then I'd pick a different one each fucking episode. Well, that's fine. But this, I guess, it, I guess as I get older, these things yep, change, right? Change. And I'd say in terms of actual output towards me and what I do and I I don't think I've done anything particularly special yet um, or in general in that this one by far has the most amount of impact so I'll I'll give you like more practical examples of this so uh, quite recently um, a guy was messaging me and we were supposed to go for a drink and he was like oh should we go oh should we go for a drink tonight or should we delay it and I was like going I remember just caught myself and I was going what's going to bring about the most luck here me going and sitting at home and just chilling out and doing nothing or going for a drink with a like-minded guy I've never met before um, and seeing what happens. And of course I was like, well, definitely the latter is. But even though naturally I was going, I just, I'm tired, I want to go home. I was like, okay, let's just put the luckiest option. As a result, lots of stuff came off the back of that. Um, and constantly looking for where, okay, I've got two potential decision trees to go down here. Which one do I think is going to bring about the most amount of luck? And constantly doing that. One of my favourite examples is my my mate Sarah. Uh, James and Reese, where they were at a Drake concert hmm. and they're at the MEN, uh, th- those two guys are massive Drake fans and they were both in the toilet. So my mate James is proper into like sneakers. He's one of the sneaker heads and he sees a, a massive guy um, in the toilets and he says, mate, I love your shoes. And he just, just randomly compliments a stranger mm-hmm. and he gets chatting. Hand on penis. <laughs> hand on penis. Was he yeah. hand on penis? Doing the whole, the, uh, the cross. There were hands on each other's penis. Yeah, of course, right, okay, of course. Cool. Um, and I don't not to a point there. Sorry. But uh, so, yeah, they sit, are complimenting him on his shoes and they get chatting back and forth. And anyway, that guy turned out to be Drake's DJ. And he goes, do you want to come back VIP with us and hang around with Drake and like Kevin De Bruyne and Paul Pogba and Odell Beckham Jr.? And they went out of like the A-list of the A-list of the A-list. I'm not saying that's something you want to aspire to, but um, that's a fucking cool story, Great, right? Man. And a great night. And as a result, whenever Drake comes to town, they text that DJ and he sorts them out. And you go, that just came down to 
compliment the guy in his shoes. Mm-hmm. And I know, but let's say you were sat there and sometimes people don't want to chat to a stranger or certainly don't want to compliment a stranger. Mm-hmm. But what's going to bring about the most amount of luck? Me just keeping that thought in my head mm-hmm. is not going to bring about that much luck. Whereas if I go, hey, mate, like this, da 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 of course he might just say, all right, mate, cheers, bye, yes. be a dick. You've not lost anything. <clears throat> but the potential amount of luck that's constantly existing, I, I always think about it, and you only see this stuff backwards, is that, you know, the whole sliding doors phenomenon where you look back and you go, oh, if I would have gone out that night where I ended up meeting my, this would have the mother of my kids, yeah. imagine if I would have just gone, oh, I'll sit at home that night. Mm. So we're constantly having these sliding doors. Even as we're chatting right now, mm. there's sliding doors moments going on. But you don't see them at the time. You can only see them looking backwards. Mm. So the sliding doors are invisible when you go through them, mm. but constantly visible when you look back. Yeah. And I think the only, I really say so much of it comes down to luck. Therefore, just having some default raises in place of going, what do I think is going to bring about the most amount of luck here? And just doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's something I'm trying to get better at anyway. I think it's a really, it's something that I'm thinking about a lot after the podcast I did with Laura Vanderkam, which I thought was really insightful. If you haven't listened to it yet, I highly recommend that you go and see it. Um, time management expert and she talks about the fact that the present self is spoiled like a petulant child we have three selves in this life the future self the past self and the present self but as you've said when the present self comes around you're actually thinking oh I'm tired it's cold outside I've had a long day I've done this that and the other staying in bed and reading or watching Netflix or not doing the thing which involves more action your body will always resort to inertia or the path of least resistance Mm. over that of one which requires more effort. And I think seeking out, going back to what we were talking about before, extreme ownership, leaning into discomfort, all of these things are gelling together in a way that's, I think, actually better than Mental Models 101. Um, But they're, they're all linked together. If you find a point where you think, well, hang on a second, am I going to really appreciate me making this effort for me tomorrow when I look back? Because if you hadn't sent me that message a year ago, yeah, we wouldn't enough. be mates. That's we wouldn't year. have done all of these cool things. Perfect example. I remember, just to put in that, I remember I sat there um, uh, thinking, oh, should I send that message? And I was like, there was genuinely a, a three-second pause as I go, should I message that guy? I was like, yeah, fuck it. What's going to be like? And I did it. And that's literally why we're chatting right now. So, yeah, yeah that's weird, isn't it? Asymmetries, going back to, to the um, mental models from the last episode, um, talking about that, about the fact that yeah action Upside's so huge yeah Downside action is almost always going to result in that so talk to the girl at the bar like and again a concept from pickup artistry like assume attraction is a really good way to go about things because it just encourages so what, when you assume they're attracted to you yes just oh, okay. always assume attraction reason being that it will encourage you into action as opposed to into inertia which is the natural state yes uh, I think yeah if you just ask yourself what's going to bring about the best Roy score at the end of the day? What's the highest fucking Roy, Roy score? Roy score. And I, I've got this weird meme I make Josh now whenever I see him. We just go like, how's your Roy score getting on? And that's how you catch up now. And, it's nice. true. and he gives you that frame going, shit, this is just a fucking Fucking game. Roy it's score. So I've got one that you might not know. Have you heard of Third Story? Have you heard of this? Metal no, model? maybe. Cool. So Third Story, you can imagine that in any normal situation, you have your point of view, my point of view. But then you'd also have a third point of view which would actually be from someone outside of the situation looking at both. A lot of the time, people will discuss um, the fact that Uh, you want to see things from someone else's perspective. You don't just need to see that, because that might not actually be the best place to see this from. The totally impartial observer probably has the best view of both. Now... We mm. spoke we, we spoke at length about uh, how much we love Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris's approach to the beginning of their debate together mm. when they steel man each other's arguments. And is it Warren Buffett who says he refuses to have a position on anything? Charlie Munger, yeah. Charlie Munger says... Refuses, I think he says he refuses to have a position on anything unless he can state the other side better than the other side can. Basically, it's what it is. And I think he calls that his iron discipline. Um, and that that catches me a lot is where I have an opinion on something and I'll keep researching my side of the opinion, keep going over it and over it and over it. And I, but I've not even looked at the other side. And it kind of holds you accountable of mm. not chatting about something. The other day I was uh, having a chat with a mate and we were strategizing at work and I, go, I catch myself in like a proper Charlie Munger moment um, where he's talking about a certain market that we should look at potentially investing in. And I go, 
You know what? I actually think that's a. I, go, I actually don't have an opinion. <laughs> I call it so good. <laughs> I never said anything about the other side. And I go, I actually don't know this subject well enough. We just want to sound clever, don't we? Yeah. So much, man. Yeah. And I. I but then we talked about earlier of the benefit of identifying publicly as an idiot. Like anybody ever listening to this, watching to this, please know that I am an imbecile. And I say that um, mainly for myself because that we were talking about earlier when you you recently, and I'm sure people who have heard the podcast a lot, you chat a lot about the benefits you got from Ron Ward and now you've you done a bit of a U-turn on that. And mm-hmm. uh, the uh, Woot Band, you've done a bit of a U-turn on that, right? And once you go out there shouting out, I am an ex or I'm a Republican, I am a Democrat, I'm a smart person... Um, I'm a, whatever you want to do, whenever you have those labels, it's then very hard to, once you've said it out loud to everyone, Mm -hmm. to then pivot and do a U-turn. And often because people don't want to be seen as being a hypocrite, but I admire people so much more once they've been so gung-ho on something and they go the other way. Like people who've been in like Scientology or the, um, who the, Oh, what's the church in America that shouts at soldiers' funerals and they and they leave and they go against their whole family? Like the ability to go against your identity, which I think is the hardest thing to do, is so impressive. Which is why I was identified as an idiot. Mm. Because if I identify as an idiot, then when I do stupid stuff, it's like the minimum viable, fail, minimum then, viable pro- yeah, product yeah, exactly. to be a, to be a exactly. thinker, isn't it? Yeah. Like what is the lowest grade entry that I can have? Lowest barriers to entry, idiot. And I think, you so, know, from, from my perspective, this is something that I touched on earlier with you, and I hadn't thought this before, but <clears throat> mercifully, one of the advantages of being a podcast host, and this is where Rogan gets it so correct, is that you don't actually ever end up being the smartest person in the room. It's very rare that Rogan's the smartest person in the room on whatever the topic is, maybe MMA sometimes, maybe comedy sometimes, but even in that, he might be sat across from Francis Ngannou, you like, oh, he's a bit better at MMA than you are. Maybe mm-hmm. not his knowledge. Maybe some nuance of that Rogan's better. Or he might be sat across from Brian Callan. You're like, well, who's the better comedian? That's up for debate, etc., etc. The advantage of being someone who is in the middle of a lot of other people and then presents that information in the way that a podcast host does is that you're never expected to actually be the, like, paragon of knowledge within an area you're just a mere simulacrum representation of what everyone else has been and that actually allows you to hold much less concrete views because everybody appreciates that really all you are is just a little reflection of all the people you've been exposed to but that's all that anyone is the only difference is when someone makes their identity about it Aubrey Marcus when you talk about how much you love polyamory Look at the comments on Aubrey Marcus's breakup video with his wife, Whitney, talking about how they're transitioning their relationship and polyamory is still the way to go. And by the way, if you want to find out what happened, tune into Whitney's podcast this Wednesday on blah, blah, blah. And the people in the comments are going, man, say how it is. Say that polyamory was a bad, a bad decision and say that you're breaking up, not transitioning. But those guys have planted the flag in the ground so hard. And maybe they do still believe this. But when you've been so forthcoming with talking about Whitney's off to go and see her boyfriend in Texas to get railed off some guy who's the 24-year-old stallion or some shit from Austin. (laughs) Yeah. And you're like, right. After you've done that, where do you go from there? It's very difficult to allow that identity to simmer back down again and for you to actually say, do you know what it is? Might have been wrong. Mm. And there's a there's a mental model that I've been thinking about for a little bit called the self-serving bias, where you uh, often have self-serving reasons for your own actions and behavior. But when you're observing others, you uh, ex- uh, excuse it as part of their intrins- intrinsic nature. So I cut someone up in traffic. It's because I'm in a rush. Someone else cuts me up in traffic. It's because they're a cunt. Yeah. I can see, and that is a part uh, due to a different view of perspective, obviously, the fact that you can only see what's inside your own head, not someone else's, but you still do that. It's called the fundamental attribution error when you attribute others' behaviours to their motivations rather than to external factors. Someone cuts you up in traffic, they might have been in a rush, you say, twat. But (laughs) when it's about yourself, you always have the excuse. Self-serving bias. Hmm. Yeah, it's very, very difficult to um, 
I don't know. Did we speak about this last time about the Warren Buffett who you'd invest in, who you'd yes. short? Did we chat about that last time? Mm-hmm. I don't even remember that. So yeah, being able to look at yourself as a as a third party, and I find it very very difficult if you actually try. I don't think it's possible to do that. The way I find it most useful is to look at other people, look at stuff that I like or or, or might disagree with. Not in terms of like a very judgmental thing. They need to stop doing that. But something I don't like personally, and then go, oh, when do I do that stuff? Or what do I like? And I go, oh, how can I do more of that stuff? And actually, you can almost flip that weird bias that we have in our head that we can see other people so clearly mm. by looking at other people, looking at mistakes they're making, mm-hmm. and assume you're making the mistake that they're making of where actually is that and try and hunt it down that way. I feel that most of these cognitive biases and stuff, rather than trying to fight them, which is what a lot of people seem to do as soon as they get in that that whole psychological ra- like rabbit hole, mm. rather than trying to fight them, just use them like so again if you realize okay whatever i identify as um it's going to be very very difficult for me to break that Mm -hmm. rather than trying to break that Mm. and going oh no i'm the guy who can defy his identity no don't do that when you just identify as what you actually want to use and use those weird little cognitive biases as a way forward and i think that's the most like meta mental model thing i found is rather than trying to fix your own cognitive biases of course you want to almost play defense where you have to you want to be defense. aware of them yeah you want to be aware of them even though you probably can't be that aware just use them like use certain stuff you realize that you're a, a shaved chimp with millions of years of evolution and you and you're probably score. not going to write rewrite the program in yourself and yeah just go for the highest roy score yeah i think um certainly for instance we're talking about the difficulty in retraining your identity let's say whatever mental model mm. you want to choose that to come up with why not say, I'm a happy person, I'm a positive person, tell your friends. If you yeah. tell your friends, I'm a happy person, I'm a positive person, you're, you're now socially accountable to your mate. Hang on, I thought you said you were a happy person, a, a, a like positive person. Oh, shit, that's something that I want that is pretty much indefensibly a good idea for me to do. Like, wh- where are you going to go from there? Like, mm. you, you want to continue to do that. So I spent, I was the... When I was younger, I was fascinated by like discipline and pushing myself. And I found that I could perform. The only time I stuck at habits for six months and could pick up a new habit every single month was when I had an app uh, called Habit Share, where every month I'd have various different friends. I'd say, okay, I'm doing this habit this month. What are you going to do? Loser buys dinner at the end of the month. Mm-hmm. And Habit Share, they can see if you check in that day. You get push notifications when they check in. And you're directly competing against one another. And I didn't, I didn't, all of a sudden, I didn't need any willpower. I didn't need any discipline. I just used the cognitive Outsource. bias of, of being asked what other people are thinking about me because, again, we're social creatures. Rather than try and fight that, mm. let's just use that. I mean, for the listeners at home, I was getting sent screenshots of your habit share thing, and I'm not even on habit share. Yeah, yeah. You were showing it off to me. Yeah, yeah, was, oh, yeah exactly. Big dicking it to me. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things that have been floating around in my head recently. So anchoring, which is kind of a little bit like first impressions matter. So where someone posits a price to you when you begin, you then make everything else relative to that. There's a really good uh, example of, about economist pricing. Have you heard this one? No. Oh, wow. So let me run you through this. So um, in Predictably Irrational, there's an example from the economist's pricing strategy, okay? So three options to yeah, subscribe. Yeah. Have you heard this one? The economist thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Three options to subscribe. Web only is $59. Print only is $125, print and web, $125. Yeah. The split is web only, 16% of people purchased, print only, 0%, print and web, 84%. Now, if you remove the print and web option, 68% instead of 16 by web only, and 32% instead of 84 by uh, print. So by adding in an option, which means yeah. nothing, you anchor people's price in a different way. And this relates to something that I'm going to butcher the example. So please send me the proper study, but the concept is still solid. Endoscopies were getting done on people and they judged the relative amount of discomfort someone was going to be in by the amount of movement. That's apparently a fairly good metric for how much discomfort there's going to be. More movement equals more pain. Mm -hmm. people went through this particular endoscopy and were asked to rate their overall pain afterwards. Now, in one iteration, the pain was at a lower rate, let's call it 4 out of 10, for almost all, 
but at the very end rose up to around about a seven. In another iteration, the experiment was actually extended. So the um, operation was longer, but finished at a two instead of at a seven. Mm. So overall, the second version, second iteration of this experiment was more total discomfort. It was longer. Uh, I think there was actually potentially like a five out of 10 throughout, five or a six throughout instead of a four, but then dropped to a two. Ask the patients to rate their relative pain at the end of it. Overwhelmingly, the patients that finished at a lower pain score, much fewer bad memories, much lower pain rating, even though through every objective measure, it should have been higher. And there's a, a quote I remember seeing online that talks about if you care about your child and they're going through an operation that they can feel, this is something that you want to happen. Because despite the fact that through every objective measure, your child will go through more pain, that pain is transient, but the memory is forever. Mm. And what they will remember will be less pain. And that to me is something that I think about a lot. Final memories or final impressions matter. The same way that first impressions matter, final impressions matter as well. Mm. So perfect example. One of the guys that I'm coaching, Sam, recently got sent out to some random country to go and train a sales team. Literally two days notice, right, mate, drop your life. You've got to go out to Istanbul somewhere. Okay, cool. Gets out there and has three weeks of chaos. And he's speaking to me about four days before he's going to leave. And he's like, well, what do you think that I should do? And I was like, what personally I think you should do is treat yourself as nicely as you can for the final two days of your holiday. Find the prettiest spot in Istanbul, take yourself out for a dinner, find some good music, do something cool, spend a little bit of money, buy Mm. yourself a nice pair of trainers, do something. And then when you come back, you are going to lean your memory towards all of the nice final finishing moments that you had on that trip. And hopefully it'll help you to forget that. So that's a really nice way to help to either double down on a nice experience or to mitigate a bad one is to try and really finish it off with something that's good. It's that stand-up comedy 101. You start off with your second best joke and then you finish with your best joke. Because that is just, yeah, it's what stand-up comedians always do. That makes a lot of sense. Um, One weird one, which you've been thinking about for a while, and I'm not smart enough to really flesh this one out, but we'll give it a go. Crack it out, Um, come on. Which is orthogonal thought. Um, which is when you come at something from a completely different angle Mm -hmm. to somebody else. So this comes from primarily Eric Weinstein, um, and he talks about two particular examples. Um, One, which is the, uh, I forgot the guy, but he was on the Japanese table table tennis team, (laughs) um, and he was one of the worst players on there. And I think, I'm not sure how many decades ago it was, but he decided to put foam on his back. Everybody else was playing with these wooden bats and he puts foam as we know it now, like a modern mm-hmm. table tennis, and he would destroy everyone and he beat everybody around and became the the best in the world at the time. And um, just from, you've got to think he could have spent hours training, like oh, 10,000 hours and probably still wouldn't even make the team. Mm. But instead, sitting at home and coming at it from a completely different perspective mm-hmm. and just putting foam on the bats <laughs> and then nobody could compete with him. It's the same with... Um, you know, the Fosby flop with the high jump. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Everybody else used to do it um, face first, essentially, jump over that way. Mm-hmm. Whereas he came at it with this weird angle. And obviously mm-hmm. people mocked him for a while, yeah, but yeah. it was a way more efficient and effective way of doing it. And then there's a, another great example of the whole suitcase on wheels stuff. That su- suitcase on wheels didn't didn't really ex- exist till like the 80s or, or whenever it was. It was a certain pilot that launched it. And... You got to think everybody was carrying around suitcases. Nobody thought to put fucking suitcases on wheels, mm. and and then one guy does it, and then that's the norm. And I'm fascinated by when you take a perspective that often there's X or there's Y. There's X or there's Y. There's the that um, Robert um, Hansen, uh, the evolutionary biologist um, and physicist, who chats about this example with like immigration, which is obviously a very very a hotly contested topic, one which is way above my pay grade and I, mm. I don't really have many opinions on, but he chats about how you have um, 
the Democrat side, which is obviously very, very pro-immigration, mm-hmm. and you have the Republican side, which is very, very anti-immigration, and they're just constantly in this tug of war against each other. And instead of having this tug of war ga- came coming on, he says, come at it from an or yeah, orthogonal perspective, and you pull it from the middle. So, for example, what about if you could, every American um, had their citizenship, and it was worth X. So let's say it was worth $100,000. Um, which meant that they could sell it on to an immigrant who wanted to come into the the country and they could move out that way. Mm. Um, and all of a sudden you you fixed a lot of the problems there. And of course that might not be the right or wrong solution, mm. but all of a sudden it is an he's come at it from a completely different vector. On a, um, on a side point to that, I podcasted with Robin Hanson just after he released Elephant in the Brain and asked him about orthogonal thinking and he was really tired that day. Oh, really? <laughs> and he didn't have a clue what I was on about. Oh, really? <laughs> it was you that had asked it as well. Oh, I was right. like, I've got a cracking question for you here, Robin. <laughs> right. What do you think about orthogonal oh, thinking? No. And he was fucking knackered. <laughs> and he was like, oh, I'm not really too sure about that one, mate. Oh, I was like, no. Oh, okay. Um, oh, no. Talking about the uh, Fosbury flop and different ways of doing was, athletics. So, what? Um, one of the first people, it may be the first, but definitely one of the first people to ever swim the English Channel <laughs> so he was a British, potentially army officer, quite high up in the in the armed forces, and he did it wearing uh, sheepskin wool, uh, covered in goose fat, drinking whiskey because it would keep him warm, and he did the whole thing breaststroke. And when he was asked, "Why did you not do the front crawl?" Because the front crawl had been invented, but recently before so not very long before you know what his answer was what? it would be unbecoming of a gentleman uh, to put my head okay. under the water wow so he did the whole English channel fucking Damn. breaststroke Damn. I love that story it would be unbecoming of a gentleman to put my head yeah. under the water wow yes it's a different time it was a better time man when when, when men wouldn't put their head under the water <laughs> So on the the orthogonal thought point, um, one thing that's particularly interesting, it ties into, you know, the the Peter Thiel question of what do you believe to be true that the rest of the world disagrees with you on? Mm -hmm. Um, A very, very like contrarian question that I've yet to hear anybody answer. With real vigor. Yeah, with real vigor. So or if go. they have, it's creeped me out. And I guess that's the point of it because yeah. it's so socially so here we go. against the, the grain. To the listeners at home, give us a tweet at Chris Will X and at George underscore underscore M A C K and answer this question as best you can. What do you believe to be true that the rest of the world disagrees with you on? Um, so, like a good example, like, and often what people will do in that scenario, they'll go, Oh, the education system's backwards. Or um, obviously a few oh, years know. ago, they said we should legalise gay marriage. You know, really, if you actually ask most of society, yeah. they all actually agree with these statements nowadays. Um, a good example would have been 20 years ago, saying I actually think that the, the way the college education system's going is backwards. And obviously Peter Thiel did that and mm-hmm. was, was proven, proven right. Um, but trying to have, or for example, in 2009, um, or it's 2008 when Satoshi, I guess, made Bitcoin, of saying, oh, I think Bitcoin will be this new global Mm. digital currency. Mm -hmm. Saying it now is going, yeah, no shit, sure, love. (laughs) Saying it back then would have been a truly contrarian statement. And you know it's contrarian when everybody looks at you like you're an absolute weirdo. But if it's the issue with that, though, is that contrarians just go either end of the the spectrum. They're either geniuses that are remembered throughout history or they're writing their own name on a wall and shits. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> like, and that's the issue with it, that you don't know who, because um, I'm definitely, I don't know if it's Navalny talks, camp, Navalny talks about it, where he says that um, in San Francisco, you've got to be polite to everyone because that weird kid in a hoodie might be the next Mark Zuckerberg. And with contrarians, you, you never know that, because if, some, if somebody would have been pitching Bitcoin to you, and I, I know it happened to me, I watched um, a YouTube video and I was, I was tired and didn't finish it. It's like, eh, Probably nothing. Mm. Um, and trying to pitch those those contrarian ideas that, in hindsight, everyone will look back and go, "That was so no obvious." Brainer. Yeah, that was an absolute no brainer. But at the because t- realistically, ninety nine percent of people listening or of people in general, if 
they was around when uh, pre-Galileo, they would have believed the world was the center of the universe. And if if anybody would try to argue with them, they would have thought they were an idiot. Mm-hmm. And I'm always trying to think now, what 50 years from now will we think is ridiculous? Mm-hmm. Um, and I also then try and think, okay, more of a personal note, what, if I look back at my behavior five years ago and find it really cringy, <laughs> What, five, anyone, years, what anyone, five years from now will I find cringy? Well, anyone who doesn't look back on their behaviour five years ago and find it cringy. No, but the issue, so this is the iOS update on that. Of course that's true. But the thing is that people forget is that what you're doing right now, people, sorry, you will find cringy five years from now. And you're almost going to come at it from the frame going, oh shit, there's going to be stuff that I'm doing right now that's going to be horrific five years from now. And the same way, and then as a large point of society, what are we doing that... 50 years from now, we're going to go, your grandkids are going to go, you used to do that. Like mm. you used to eat meat. Again, that's a contentious issue. Meat's, or, meat's used, one of the ones that I think. Yeah, particularly with the factory farming stuff. So trying to take a perspective of 50 to 100 years from now. Like I, uh, one of my favourite examples is when they do a themed sort of fancy dress party <laughs> of of us, it's going to be a load of people like not chatting to each other in a room. Like with their fucking Bent eye over. posture, just texting each other. I reckon that's what those theme parties are going to be like. You yeah, because well, there'll be different communication methods by then. And this weird constant, you have to, you look at like uh, the Neuralink stuff that um, Elon Musk doing, this idea that we're okay. And this goes back to orthogonal thought. Before the whole Neuralink stuff came along, would you have thought? that actually it would make way more sense if I could just zap it from my brain to your brain. No, you assume like, it's a keyboard, this is the quickest way to do it. Yeah. But if you ever actually count how long it takes you to text via a keyboard, it's so long. But because everybody else is doing it, mm-hmm. you assume it's the norm. You're the, you're the, you're the sheep, you, f- you follow the crowd. And um, the one of the favourite mental models that Tim t- I took from Tim Urban, and it's the screensaver on my laptop, which is the cook versus the chef. Have you heard of that one? No. So a people often assume maybe a cook and a chef are the same thing, but there's a, there's a fine, fine difference is what Tim Urban argue, uh, argues in that a cook gets a recipe that's been made and makes it. Mm-hmm. Whereas a chef creates his own recipe. And that's the difference between just following, okay, uh, texting is the quickest way I can do this. That's what a cook does because cooks just follow what everyone else is doing. Whereas a chef thinks about it and goes, actually, if I had to design this recipe, if I had to get a message from my head to Chris's head the quickest, what would it be? And it'd be literally thinking, just do, 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 like that. Mm-hmm. And it'd be, it'd be quicker than this, quick as the speed of light. So l- looking at it from a cook's perspective and a chef's perspective, and then it comes back, it could, these things always loop around in the, then Tim Urban argues that, if you're a chef, explore various different recipes, t- t- um, test it, taste test it. Goes, oh, that's a bit shit, that's a bit rubbish. And of course, most of the time you're going to look like you're doing worse than a cook because they've already got a predefined route. Mm. But I'll, I'll, when a chef does win, it, they win big. And ultimately, you're playing a fucking game of Roy anyway. It is just Roy, man. Um, I was, I've been searching around to try and find this quote. I finally found it. Changing your habits often requires you to change your tribe. Each tribe has a, sh- a set of shared experiences, behaviours that conform to the shared expectations are attractive, behaviours that conflict with the shared expectations are unattractive. It's hard to go against the group. James Clear, Atomic Habits. So what do you think we'll, be the, we'll look back on 50 to 100 years? I now? think you're right about that. I think um, the jeans that lads in Newcastle wear, <laughs> I think they're probably, yeah. they've got to be pretty high up. Yeah. Tight girl jeans. I'm not sure, man. I mean, the the defining characteristics right now, you don't know how quick things are going to move. Like, what's the paradigm going to shift on? Are we still going to be looking at a political system similar to the one that we've got now? Like, is is that really what's going to continue? Is it going to evolve or is it just going to be more of the same? We can presume that technology will change, but politics actually hasn't seen any big dynamic changes or shifts in terms of the way that they're deployed, so like general public vote, et cetera, et cetera. Like it, it requires a large movement to occur. And because of the way that those things happen, they're often unforeseen up until the point at which they do happen. Like going the other way, like what was going to change from 50 years ago until in 50 years time, considering that now, who could have predicted Facebook? 
who could have predicted the internet? Like, you don't know that these things are going to happen and you just end up post, post hocking the shit out of it if you do. Mm. Like, you know, that narrative fallacy where yeah, you retrospectively explain it and you have this beautiful image in your head. Um, it's a guy called Brad Stone who wrote um, The Everyday Store. Um, it's about Amazon and Jeff Bezos and describes the story of Jeff Bezos and what happened to Amazon. And apparently Jeff was a bit reluctant to do it. And when he first sat down with Brad Stone, he basically said, how are you going to avoid the narrative fallacy? How are you going to mm. not make it look back that I had this perfect plan to begin with and it all and it all executed exactly as I had it planned and not retrospectively ignore factors like luck and experimentation and failure that went on. I mean, it's, yeah, we always look back and just tell ourselves a story. Before we finish, I wondered if you wanted to give us a short breakdown on your favourite blog post of all time. Oh, interesting. You um, want to do it? Yeah, let's do it. Cool. Um, this will be linked in the show notes below. It's one of the worst titles. It's very clickbaity, but I think the actual content of it, um, it's, I think it's six harsh truths to make you a better person or along those lines. Um, I think it's David Wong who wrote it. It is, yeah. Um, and he has... You, you do it. I think you might do a better job than me. So the blog post basically talks... The, the synopsis of it is you are what you can present to society. And society is only bothered in what it can get from you. That's the main truth. And the first example is imagine that you're walking on the street with a loved one and a car comes along hits your lover. They're lying on the floor bleeding and you're screaming for someone who has some medical experience. A person comes over and kneels down next to them and you ask them, <laughs> you're laughing already, and you ask them, um, oh, fantastic, are you a doctor? This person turns to you and starts telling you about how they're a good father, how they're always trustworthy and how they're never late for work. And you go, oh, hang on a second, I, I, didn't, I didn't ask you about that. What I said was, do you have some medical experience? And this person begins to get a little bit irritated now. They say, well, no, you, you're not listening to me. I'm a very good person and I, I always I always stick to my promises and I'm always true to my virtue and my, my kids really love me. And you say, screaming at them, look, I do not care about your values or your virtues. Tell me whether or not you can save my dying partner on the street. And the analogy that he uses is society is the dying man on the street and you are the person standing over them holding a pen knife in a desperate attempt to try and bring them back to life. All that society is concerned about is what you can produce. Do you want to elaborate? Yeah. Um, I think uh, going back to Paul Graham, which we started off with, he has, I think he used to have it on either YC's walls or his own walls, which is make something people want. Because he would have so many young entrepreneurs who would come through with these ideas of how they're going to change the world. And they would always fail that fundamental thing of they're not making something that people want. Like nobody actually wants this idea. And if I look at any ideas I've had or friends have had, it's the reason why it often fails is because they've, they've sort of kept themselves in their own bubble and they've not actually gone and found out if this is actually what people want. Um, and again, you've almost got to apply that same thing to yourself. But instead of just... There's a great clip uh, from Glenn Gary, uh, Glenn Ross, I think it is, um, by Alec Baldwin. I think he's only in it for eight, nine minutes. He won an Oscar for that performance. Mm. And he just says, um, nice guy, I don't give a shit. Go home and play with your kids. Um, and, it, and that sounds brutal. It, it sounds horrific, but it's almost objective of somebody who's never met you before looking at you objectively going, what can you do for me? And people see that as a very, very almost a dark and negative world. Um, but I actually think it's, it's, it's the way we operate. We're always constantly looking at making society better. And the, the reason why I always use the analogy that, um, that sale, that sorry, networking in particular, again, if you talk about contrarian opinions, and this is a bit nuanced, but networking can be largely, I think, overrated by a certain sort of individual um, who very, very ca like nice and charismatic and can chat a good game and has read a, a, a few books, but there's no substance to anything they've ever, they've ever done. Mm -hmm. um, they, there's nothing on their actual rap sheet. I've got, I can, oh, I can code this or I know how to build a sales team like 
this or I've achieved uh, this many uh, things at CrossFit this week or whatever it is, mm. right? Um, we always just want to be liked for being a nice guy. But mm. everyone's a fucking it's nice It's extreme guy. ownership again, isn't it? Yeah. Going back to, to the Navy SEAL stuff. Another great point that David Wong comes up with in that article is where he talks about people believing that they deserve a good partner. Mm. And they say, well, look at how trustworthy I am and I'm really caring and, I, you know, I've got a good job and I've got stable income and this, that and the other. And he, in the blog post, he says, so fucking what? That is what you need to get you through the door. And there is a guy out there who has everything you have and he can play the fucking guitar. Yeah. And I'm like, David, you, you got it, man. Like, there is a guy out there who has every talent that you have and he can play the fucking guitar. Mm. How are you going to compete with a man that can play the guitar? I, I, I think you are right. It is a... But he, what's he great? He's, he, had a, he has a nuanced point in that um, he says that what you do or what you've done is actually a real reflection of who you are. Do you get what I mean? Whereas if, if who you are is all you are and you've not produced anything, then actually it wasn't what you are. That's a little bollocks, right? Mm. What you produce is ultimately a reflection of what your your thoughts are. It's that whole slightly weird thing of, oh, I'll, if somebody's, oh, let's say there's a, there's a hurricane that's gone on, I'll, I'll pray for those people. And of course, I think a lot of people who do that are, are, are um, trying to do something Yeah, they're good. trying to do some good, but... Let's, you can, if you actually do something as well, clean wow, up. that's that's where the real power is. Well, and of that, course you can pray and do that at the same time, but fucking hell. What, like. what were we saying earlier on about the path of least resistance, about inertia as opposed to movement? Like, I, you are right. I think it's it's not a very softly, softly approach. I bet if um, some of the Navy SEALs read that blog post, I bet they would agree with it. Guys that are forced into action guys that have to do things first. Um, it's not a very sentimental way to view things, but I would struggle to see how looking at output first, what are the things, what are the explicit, tangible, objective measures by which I have represented my value in the mm. real world. If you use those, I struggle to see how life comes at you with things that you're going to be unprepared for or at least I think you give yourself the best chance of being robust or anti-fragile enough to deal with them yeah because we, we can all edit our Instagram photos to look like successful entrepreneurs but your p l sheet is what actually matters right and that's that's the difference and I guess you know that's what, what actually, actually happens what Roy score Roy score I guess that's that's a good way to uh to end on um it's just a, it's just a game. There's a great bit as well, similar to the Roy score bit of, um, you've seen the Bill Hicks bit. It's just a ride. It's very, very similar to, um, the Roy score of where you can end up going down lots of different rabbit holes and thinking very, very deeply about stuff. But once you realize we've got a very, very limited time on this earth and a hundred years from now, no one will probably remember your name. Um, yeah, man. It's been fantastic again. I hope that everyone that has tuned in has enjoyed it. Mental Modders 102, we have finished. Yeah, you got me out of my cave, mate. You forced me out of my cave. I know, all the way from London to Newcastle to come and record a podcast. Um, where are people going to find you? George underscore M-A-C-K on Twitter. I'm going to force them to tweet at you so that you're forced to reply <laughs> because you're too polite to not reply to people, but you're not on Twitter at the moment because you're too busy working. Fitting 200 hour work stuff. weeks into one yeah, into a 100 hour week. Yeah, yeah. Just avoiding the carpet store one day at a time. Good man. Thank you very much for tuning in. Please like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. I do appreciate it every time that you do. At Chris Willex on all social media, if you've got any questions, at George underscore underscore Mac on Twitter as well. <laughs> Thank you very much, man. Bye. Peace.